everybody. My name is Luke Marr and this is Hot La Mode. And today on Hot La Mode, we are coming to you with your Met Gala 2023 Fashion Roast Part 2 of 4. We got a lot to get through. Listen, as we all know, Karl Lagerfeld Line of Beauty was the exhibition and the theme was in honor of Karl. So homages and inspirations and references to Karl Lagerfeld's work was a template. Again, do people follow it? No, but well such as life. We have a few cool, fun, exciting people to discuss. I'm very excited. I think it's going to be a good time. So let's get into it. First up, we have Alton Mason and Alton is wearing a Karl Lagerfeld custom look. Karl had his own brand. I believe that it debuted either in the late 1980s or early 1990s. It looks like Alton looked at Carl's brides at the end of most of his Chanel shows. He had a bride of sorts come out, specifically the Haute Couture shows. And with Alton being the first black male model to walk for a Chanel show in the entirety of the brand's history at that point, which had been, what, 100? ish years 90 something years it's also smart to see that Alton is the first male bride that we're going to get to see from a Karl Lagerfeld standpoint so the look is made up primarily of lace it has a sharper sort of shoulder which is encrusted with crystals there's a high neck there are sleeves made up of lace as well part of it is made up specifically of the weave and then other parts are clusters of beautiful floral flowers it comes up to the hand it creates fingerless gloves which is a great sort of dedication and settlement not to Carl in his own personal wardrobe. Fingerless gloves is what he wore. We can see that there is a bustier of sorts going on, which is full of lace as well. It does not reach the pec area. It sits right underneath it. So it exposes the sort of pecs. And then there is a pant that flows down again opaque in certain places and sheerer in others, again with all in this lace. And then we have these big frothy boots. I think they're fun. I think they're cool. I think they're different. Alton also wears a large veil that falls right to around thigh area and he's holding a bouquet of lace flowers. I think it's fun. I think it's cool. I think that it's a way to expand upon Carl's work. I think that lace was a big part of what he did at Chanel specifically. And at Chanel, it was also a way that he sort of diverted from Chanel's own sort of ethos. She never had brides at the end of a show. She thought it was stupid. She thought it was dumb. Carl didn't do that. He sort of brought the brides to become a part of Chanel, built in the Chanel bride as a sort of house code to a degree. I think it's interesting that Alton, who usually goes for it when it comes to the Met Gala and goes for it in general, is also sort of going for it here. I love the boots. I love the lace. I love the idea of jumpsuit bridal ensemble. And I also love the fact that you don't have to be a woman to be a bride. You can also wear white and look great at your wedding. Next up, we have Amanda Seyfried, and she is wearing Oscar de la Renta by Fernando Garcia and Laura Kim. Now, it's a sheer dress that is meant to be sort of like a nude illusion with these strands of metallic fabric, almost I think they're beads actually that sort of run all the way from the neckline, creating a sort of halter style, and flows down to around the mid thigh in certain areas. It's like these sort of bangs of beads that run along. I also think the way that the light reflects, sometimes they look silver, sometimes they look gold. I'm all for the the idea of the nude illusion look. I think it's very much so an Oscar staple and it's become a house code under Fernando and Laura. I just think that the medium of these little beads doesn't really make sense for the Carl theme. I wish it had been like beads and we had gotten like a real nude illusion concept. I wish it had been gold chains. I wish it had been faux jewelry. I wish it had been something, you know, that really creates an idea that, oh my God, she is naked under there. Can I tell? I'm not sure, but I think she is. I think that that really creates fun and drama and excitement and intrigue. And I think that this just falls flat. It doesn't really say Carl, doesn't really say Fendi, doesn't say Chanel, doesn't say Patu, doesn't say Balmain, doesn't say Chloe, doesn't really say anything. And I think that's the big issue. It doesn't say anything. It's just there. I kind of wish it wasn't. Next up, we have Anita and she is wearing Marc Jacobs. Now, listen, it's a black off the shoulder dress. It has a large structural draped silk structure flowing out of her left shoulder. The dress is form fitted. It comes down to around the hip area, the lower waist on the right side, and creates a big sort of bow, a big ruffle that flows 
out and creates a little bit of a train. And then the dress sort of finishes right above the ankle area and showcases those sequined or crystallized kiki boots. The black, the white, simple, easy. I do think that to a degree, the dress kind of feels Lagerfeldian in terms of big bustle, referencing the Victorian period, sure. But at the same time, like, is it really? Or are we just like doing a big bustle dress and calling it, oh, Carl Lagerfeld reference? Like, I don't see it personally. Like if I want to look really hard with a magnifying glass, yeah, sure. I absolutely could. I could try to find things and make things work and all that sort of stuff. But while Anita looks beautiful, because it does fit really, really well, I have to say absolutely 100%, it feels boring in terms of context, reference, influence. It feels uninteresting. It feels unintriguing. It feels uninspired. And I know some people are going to be like, well, doesn't matter. You just meant to go and look good. That's not why you watch this video. You don't watch this video for somebody that just looks good. Okay. Go watch your news. Have a good time. Here, I want to see a reference. I want to see the influence. I want to see intrigue. I want to see detail. I want to see something. And there is nothing here. Okay. Anita's Brazilian. I know that there are Brazilian haute couture clients. I know that there have been Brazilian haute couture clients for decades. I just feel like she could have tapped into somebody cool and interesting and intriguing. There are so many amazing Chanel and Fendi and Balmain and Patu, Chloe collections. It just feels lazy. And that's both, I think, on Anita's part and on Marc Jacobs' part. The one night to not just look pretty, pretty gorgeous is the Met Gala. So listen, do it at the Grammys, do it at the VMAs, do it anywhere else. I'm fine with that. But here, intrigue, interest, memorable, iconic, exciting, something. Next up, we have Ashley Graham, and she is wearing a custom look by Harris Reed. Now listen, this is how you do referencing. Ashley Graham is wearing a look that is referencing Chanel's, I believe, 1987 fall haute couture collection, which was based on the French opera Atisse. It's definitely different, but in reality, you can see that the initial concept idea is there. It's just been tweaked by Harris Reed, which is the point of this. Take an iconic look and then put your own spin on it and everybody's happy. So from that haute couture collection, we can see that the pink silk is very much so there. We can see that there are these matching sort of swags of fabric that's sit on the hips and almost exaggerate them, sort of like a pannier style, but a little bit more dietized. We can also then see that there is a boned pink corset underneath, fits beautifully. And what's really, really great here is that Harris sort of embedded himself in different ways, like these little off the shoulder, sort of moments. They're like rings that wrap around the shoulder, but they're black. So it adds a different layer to it. The off the shoulder element is kind of a Carl signature, most definitely. But I think the way that Harris sort of created this circular structure gives it a little bit more Harris Reed volume. And then as we move down, we can see at the knee, there is this very, very, very large mermaid skirt emerging. That's a Harris signature. If you look at most of Harris's gowns in a way, that's what materializes. And we can see that the pink sort of fades away way and allows this black velvet to continue out and create again this large sort of shape. Listen, is it my favorite look in the entire world? No, but do I think that it's a great example of take what is given to you in terms of referencing, add your own spin on it, and people are going to be happy. I think Ashley Graham looks wonderful. She looks gorgeous. She looks stunning. I think the dress is great. It references well to a niche collection for those that don't know much about Carl's work. And at the same time, adds in Harris's sort of house codes in a way that brings it to be something new while still sort of reminiscing on the old. That's all anybody asked. That's it. Nothing much. Not too much work. Didn't ask anybody to do anything but put your own spin on plagiarization. It's not tough. Next up, we have Camilla Marone, and she is wearing Rodarte. I do not know her work, which is my new polite way of saying I do not know who she is. But I now know who she is because she looks stellar. Listen, she's wearing a very high-waisted, almost empire line black skirt. Touches right below the bust area, is form-fitting at around the sort of knee. It fans out into a little bit of a mermaid skirt. Beautiful. I mean, the go days on it, you can see the way that that hem really sort of curtainizes itself. It's beautiful. It's really, really gorgeous there. It's subtle. It's not trying to take too much attention. But the great thing about the Rodarte look too here is that this white lace sort of collar bib is stunning. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. It does a great job of encompassing black and white, which again, Carl's signature, but does it in a way that feels kind of new, kind of fun, kind of fresh, and also feels rather Rodarte. I think that that lace is gorgeous. Lace is also a Rodarte signature, so sticking with that 
makes sense. And at the same time, I think the way that the lace sort of only dips exposes sort of a little bit of side bubbage if it wasn't for the sheer sort of base going on underneath there. It's miraculous. It's beautiful. It feels fresh. It feels new. And at the same time, it's very crisp. It's very clean. It's really simple. It's a great example of, again, like you don't have to reinvent the wheel here. You just kind of have to make do with what is there, bring it into your own, reconceptualize it, and bing, bang, boom, like it's a beautiful look. I think this is gorgeous. I love it. Stun it. One of my favorites. Next up, we have Cara Delevingne. She is wearing a custom Cara Lagerfeld look. The thing that I like about this look is the way that it is essentially a white sort of cotton shirt. It has a plunging neckline. It's been turned into a dress. It's a little mini dress. There are black leather leg warmers going on placed over top of stilettos. And what happens is this dress, even though it looks like a cotton shirt to me, A, sort of channels Carl and his love of cotton shirts and things like that. He was very much into his shirtage, even from when he was young to, you know, the day he died. It's what he really loved. But a really great nod that I don't think anybody really touched upon, and this is probably the only time that I'd ever say, oh my God, this is amazing, I love it, is the way that there is this overflow of fabric on the bust drapes over and pulls over. It's a reference to the 1920s and the 1930s and the way that garments would fit, the way that little pieces would sort of flow over. It was something that Carl did all the time throughout most of the Halt and Mode videos about Carl's work at Chanel. Anytime it appeared, I was like, this is disgusting. I hate this. I hope it obliterates itself. But it was historical accurate. It was paying homage to early sort of Chanel runways. It paid homage to Patu, paid homage to his work at Patu as well. It's a really great subtle way to just say, listen, I want a little overflow. It works. It's easy. And Cara here, she did it. She did it. And I say, bravo. Thank you. Because at least somebody did a reference that wasn't just tweed or camellias or whatever. It's something that somebody actually looked at his work and said, oh, this is not simple, basic, boring, uninteresting, surface level bullshit. No, no, no. Let's like look at something that was done in a lot of the collections and say, ah, oh, that could be cool. Let's try it. Instead of doing a sort of floor length gown, which a lot of those styles did where they bloused over, as I call it, we turned it into a mini dress with a very long train and cape sleeves. Like, that's great. That's fun. That's amazing. It's different. Again, it's reinventing the idea. It's not that hard. Next up, we have Cardi B, and she wore three different looks the night of the Met. Now, this is the look that she left the Mark Hotel in. It is a custom Miss Sohi look. Miss Sohi, great designer. We stand. Big fan. What Miss Sohi and Cardi came up with is a recreation in Miss Sohi House Codes of the fall 2008 haute couture look, which came down the Chanel runway. It is a grayish white full length gown, tulle, veil, and sleeves that reach all the way up the top of the head and then come down the back as well. It's a really, really gorgeous piece. And what happened was Cardi turned it into more of what I would say like a Vegas showgirl sort of style is, which to me, honestly, kind of feels very Cardi anyway, which I'm not opposed to. So as we can see, there is a large pink tool sort of halo that encompasses all around Cardi, starting around the butt area and then comes up over top. It isn't sort of sleeved in the way that the original look was, but again, interpretation. What we can see on the bodice is a Miss Sohi classic. It's this beautiful pink pearlescent draped style. It sort of wraps in around the waist. It looks like prosciutto ham done ever so effortlessly. This very low cut neckline is trimmed in pearlescent crystals. And there's also a sort of double pearl strand that wraps right around the hips too. As we can see, the dress also then flows out into a full pink sheer skirt and the bottom is crystallized as well. Definitely an intriguing interpretation of the Chanel look. And honestly, I kind of like it. It uses it as the basis. It's not a super duper big reference that's, you know, really been kept to, but I don't mind that. She definitely has a sort of Vega showgirl sort of style, and it's something that we've seen before, but I love getting to see it interpreted by Miss Sohi. I mean, the bustier is gorgeous. It's beautiful. It's stunning. Even the way that the drape is done is so artisanal and gorgeous. I think Carl would have liked it. All in all, I think it's a good look. It's definitely a looser interpretation, but I don't think that that's a bad thing. Next up, we have Conan Gray, and he is wearing Bellman. This is a custom look, and it's definitely an interpretation of Carl's sort of signature style with the high collar, the tie, the black suiting, but done much differently. I think the leather pants with the quilted sort of detail and the boots, I think it's probably one of the better interpretations of the Carl sort of signature suiting. Let's start up top. I think Cone is probably the only person in this Bellman look that has actually achieved the idea of the Carl very high Victorian 
collar shirt. It's very signature to what Carl wore and everybody just kind of did like simple collar, easy, but like, no, no, no. If you're going to do it, then do it correctly. And I think this is a great example of that. I love the little brooch right where the tie is. I think it's fantastic. I think it adds and brings in the whole Carl ism the black tie simple clean classic skinny tie which too very important you know what i mean very very important we can see then there's a white shirt still kind of coming underneath and this off the shoulder jacket comes in again off the shoulder signature cut of carl and his work i like the fact that the black is crystallized it shines it's easy but the way that the jacket comes in it's also very much so trimmed in these big bobbly pearls that move all along the look we can see the fingerless glove detail on the sleeves also very important we can also see a fan. Carl carried a fan around for, I would say, the majority of what? the 80s, 90s, almost into the early 2000s. It was what he did. It was a way that he kind of shielded himself and his face. And it was something I think that had a lot to do with the way that he felt about his weight and things like that. It was something that Carl very much so kept and was part of his persona for quite some time. So it's cool to see the pearlescent element sort of embed itself there too. I love the black leather pants. I think it pays a great homage to Eddie Slaman's Dior Homme, which Carl really loved. It's how he dressed. It's how he wanted to look. And the black cowboy boots, I think only continue play into that Eddie Sman do your own Carl look of the early 2000s into, you know, the end of his life. I love this. I think this is probably one of the best Carl impersonations. And while I don't love the fact that everybody tried to impersonate Carl, I think this is probably one of the better ones, if not the best one. Next up, we have Devin Aoki, and she is wearing a custom Jeremy Scott look. It's a off-the-shoulder white and black gown. The bodice area of the dress is all about draping. I just love the way that that off the shoulder comes right around the back and also the way that the sort of white swags of fabric crisscross around the front too. Sequin skirt, it's gorgeous, it's beautiful, it looks liquidy, it's a simple sort of mermaid cut, it doesn't really take too much attention away from what's going on up top. But I think the interesting thing about the look really is the way that out of the bust area flows these trompe l'oeil wings. They are filled with feathers and I think that Jeremy Scott here is doing a very smart idea of playing with the idea of trompe l'oeil. It's something that Carl honestly utilized quite a lot. I think the only people that really touched upon it the whole time was the people from Chloe, I would say outside of Devin. And the other thing that I think is interesting is Devin was a Chanel muse. She walked countless Chanel shows and there was even one show where she was a Chanel bride and she had this big hat and sort of neck cuff that was filled with feathers, white feathers specifically. And so I wonder if that's kind of what Jeremy and Devin were playing on here. I think it's smart. I think it's Jeremy. I think it makes sense. It's witty. It's humorous. And that also very much was a part of Carl's design. Not always at places like Chanel Haute Couture, but at Chanel Ready to Wear and at Chloe and at Fendi. It was always jabby and fun and humorous. In that way, I think that those little wings are the perfect little touch to play on a few different Carl signatures that we really didn't see much of the entire T of this red carpet. So I'm a big fan. Next up we have Elle Fanning and she is wearing Vivian Westwood and Cartier. Now Elle Fanning said that she wanted to go and recreate an iconic moment for her with Carl Lagerfeld, which was when he asked her to be a part of the little black jacket photo book. In those images we can see Elle is wearing a black sort of tweed jacket, a little flower crown, and a white top underneath. Now here, Andreas Kronthaler of Vivian Westwood actually recreated the look to a degree. He added this black bolero jacket with a strapless white, full length, gorgeous A-line gown. As we can see that the top of the dress is much more opaque and then around the knee area, an underskirt sort of flows out of the same lace. Nothing too crazy. Personally, very Karl Lagerfeld, in my opinion, during his work at Chanel. I think we see a lot of those underskirts flowing out of big bodice styles like this. I'm kind of happy to see it. I think it's fun also that Elle went for the flower crown with the black sort of bows in it. Again, pays homage to something that she felt was really, really spectacular for her and a very sort of vivid memory of Carl. And then she had a big bouquet of daisies. I love it. I think it gives a much more flower power girl element to the look. It feels a little bit Chloe-esque, a little bit 1970s, I think, with headband and the flowers. It just feels flower child E, but mixed in with some Chanel styles, which in reality is a weird, but I think 
fun way of incorporating multiple Carl design codes together, which was asking a lot from everybody else. So again, I think this is pretty good. I'm into it. Next up, we have Erica Badu, and she is wearing a custom look from Marnie. It is a fully tasseled and fringed style. I believe it's some sort of caftan cape style. We can see that there is a long fringed headpiece with jewels flowing out of it. And then we can see there is a high neckline and caftan-y cape dress. Again, it's just filled with fringe and tassels and strips of different jewels. And then around her neck, she has layered on all of these different antique looking costume jewelry sort of styles. And I think it kind of works. Carl at Chanel, there was a lot of fringe involved. It's just kind of what he did. It's something that went in different directions. It usually wasn't as long and as big and as caftan-y as this. Usually it was more subtle. It trimmed the hems of skirts and dresses or jackets and tops. But I think here we're seeing a little bit more of the inspiration of somebody like a Poiré and a Patu on Carl. I think the fact that it's a big sort of flowy caftan harkens back a little bit to the idea of Orientalism, which was very popular with designers like Chanel and Patu during the 1910s and the 1920s. And Carl often referenced Poiré, again, who was somebody that utilized Orientalism as aesthetic to build his brand. I wouldn't say that Erica Badu is sort of doing Orientalism here, but I'm trying to give a context of where this kind of fits into Carl's work. I think then on top of it, you add this layer of jewelry, which sort of pays homage to Chanel and the fringe, it all ties together to be actually a kind of nouveau interesting way of referencing Carl and the house codes that he incorporated and played with over the decades. I also think it's like Erica Badu, so it's always gonna be intriguing and interesting and fun. So stamp of approval. Next up, we have Giselle Bundchen, and she is wearing a look from Chanel Spring 2007 Haute Couture collection. It is a high collar white dress with a sheer sort of sternum and shoulder sleeve situation, although I believe that Giselle's is unsleeved. There is also strips of white embroidery that run from the neckline area all the way down to the floor, and there are these sheer lines that run throughout it as well. This big feather cape also sits on Giselle's shoulders and flows all the way out. Giselle also was paying homage to a shoot that she did with Karl Lagerfeld for Harper's Bazaar Korea, which I believe was done in 2007 at some point. In that image, she sort of throws this big feather cape up. She looks gorgeous. She looks stunning. And I think it's fun to see the Chanel muses take on different styles that meant something to them and that they were a part of and sort of bring it back to the red carpet. I think that it not only speaks to the idea of like sustainability and the way that people are reusing looks and happy to sort of pay homage to things of the past, but also I think it's just great to see people really say, listen, I'm endeared to this look. It's something that I remember. It's something that I care about. It's something that I had a great time wearing and I'm happy to wear it again. In a weird way, it's kind of the antithesis to what Carl did because Carl's way of working was so look, 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 piece, 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 reference, 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 reference. All of these different things were constantly done. See Season after season, he switched what he was looking at, what he was feeling. He never really was doing the exact same thing over and over again. In a weird way, it's kind of like the antithesis of what Carl did. But at the same time, I do think it's very intriguing that Giselle said, listen, this is something that I loved and that I was so happy to wear. So she rewore it. So I don't know. I'm into it. I think it's fun. Next up, we have Grace Elizabeth wearing Christopher John Rogers. I think that there are a few designers that really were saying, oh, I'm going to do something that is not surface level Carl Lagerfeld knowledge. And Christopher John Rogers is one of them. Now, some people might interpret this as the, the pink thing that I've seen on Twitter about how Carl hated pink. And it's like, he didn't really hate pink because he did pink quite a lot. But but whatever. It's not that. I'm pretty positive that Christopher John Rogers reinterpreted Russian constructivism, which was not only a Chanel house code, but also something that Carl was very, very intrigued in throughout the majority of his life. As we can see, there is a halter neck style. It's beautiful, and there are different strips of pink fabric, which is very sort of Christopher John Rogers house Cody. But what we really can see here is the way that these lines are very geometric, they're very intriguing, they're very sort of different. It flows into this big, beautiful, bulbous skirt as well. All these different shades of pinks coming together in really intriguing ways. And the thing is, the Russian constructivist movement, we talked about it in Chanel reviews, 
pass. Russian constructivism came about after the fall of the Russian Empire. Coco Chanel got all these noble people that fled Russia during, you know, the Russian Revolution. She got them to do embroidery. Russian geometric and sort of folk patterns and embroideries were very, very popular with Chanel and the other designers during the 1910s and 1920s. But what Karl also did was he was very inspired by what came after the fall of the Tsar and the Tsarina, which was Russian constructivism. Karl kind of loved that period. He thought it was very intriguing. It's something that Chanel still references to this day. I'm pretty positive that even if Chris doesn't know that that's what he's doing, which I don't believe so, I believe that he knows what he's doing, but even if he doesn't, he still nailed it. I love the dress. It almost has a robe de steel sort of style to it. It's not exactly robe de steel e you know, 1920s drop waist and big bouffant sort of skirt, only because the skirt really starts around the sort of waist area and the, the drop waist isn't really pronounced, but I'm still gonna give Chris the benefit of the doubt that he's doing robe de steel too. It's kind of this really beautiful 1920s reference going on here, which Carl loved, Carl very much so enjoyed, and I just think Chris is a star. It's wonderful. Now, next up is Jack Harlow. He is wearing Tommy Hilfiger. Now, I'm pretty positive that Tommy Hilfiger and Carl Lagerfeld as brands are both owned or at least partially owned by G3, which is a big apparel group. I think what Tommy Hilfiger here is doing, a little Chanel reference on Jack Harlow. It's a navy blue tweed with little silk trim that goes along the collar, the pockets, the pants, they fit decently, which is shocking because normally Jack Harlow's pants always fit awfully. It's very uninspired to be honest, but also at the same time, like, is it a Chanel tweed men's reference, which is what Carl brought around. There was no Chanel tweed for men until Carl did it. Sure. Do I wish that Jack had done something a little bit more interesting? Sure. But at the same time, it's men on the red carpet. At least he wore tweed. You know what I mean? It's not a black tuxedo. So I think I might take it. I think. Next up, we have Jackson Wang, and he is wearing custom Louis Vuitton. Now listen, it's a military inspired jacket. It has a sort of military braiding that runs across. It's a high collar sort of style. The pants fit whatever, the shoes, black boots, the gloves. My thing is, I don't really understand what this has to do with Karl Lagerfeld. And so I say, I don't get it. Now, from my understanding, Bernard Renault and Karl Lagerfeld were acquaintances, knew each other, I guess maybe a little bit more than acquaintances. Karl was the creative director of Fendi. Fendi was bought by none other than LVMH. I don't really know why there wasn't, I don't know, some attempt from the Louis Vuitton custom team to like go for something Karl Lagerfeld inspired. And also if you're gonna wear black leather gloves, like just make them fingerless. Not difficult, not tough. I just think this is like a Louis Vuitton look and they're like, we don't really care. And Jackson Wang also was obviously like, don't care. So I don't like that. No, thank you, you can go. Next up, we have Jeremy Pope who wore a custom Bellman look. Now this Bellman look is made up of a black suit with flare pants, but the thing that's really of intrigue, of interest, really the whole look in and of itself is a high low tool cloak cape. It's white, it wraps around Jeremy's upper torso and then it flows out and creates this gigantic, I would even say tapestry of sorts that depicts a portrait of Karl Lagerfeld with sunglasses, his hair, you know, black jacket, high collar. Some may say, well, that's a little bit on the nose. And I would agree, but the thing about Karl Lagerfeld is with his own imagery, he was kind of on the nose. There is a collection, I believe it's spring 2009 from his own brand, Karl Lagerfeld, where he made certain objects like a handbag that essentially depicted him and the handles were where your eye would go and then it would kind of come down and it was his face and the shirt, the tie. Karl depicting himself and playing on himself is not uncommon at Fendi. You had Carlito, which was the Fendi bag charm made of all fur that depicted Carl as well. It's not a strange thing for Carl to reference himself on the runway. It wasn't super duper common, but it was certainly not unheard of. I also think the tool shaping going on up here does sort of reference Carl's first collection for Chanel, the Haute Couture, spring 1983. There's this beautiful sort of jacket of tool that it just has a similar shape and I'm really intrigued. So to be completely honest, I kind of like this take. Now some people might say, oh, it's a little bit ass kissy, but I think it's more so a design code. You don't have to like the design code. You know, I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is it has provenance. You don't have to like the provenance, be my guest, but it does. I personally, from a craftsmanship perspective, it probably took a long time to make that. It's a big, 
big cape. And I think that it is funny. I think it is humorous. I do think, again, it has provenance, it has context, it has reference. I'm good with it. Next up, we have Jordan Roth, who is wearing Scaparelli. Now, this is a custom Scaparelli creation. It's beautiful. Now, listen, the bodice of this dress is made up entirely of a fan's motif. If we look at the base of this fan, it's made up of little pieces of glass or little pieces of metal or little pieces of something black that we saw in the most recent Scaparelli collection. Those little tiny pieces sort of created these really beautiful styles that created bodices and sort of fan motifs. So it's actually kind of a Scaparelli thing that Daniel Roseberry has been doing, which I think is very, very smart and only really the girls that get it get it. We can see that there's like a little cat, sunglasses. There's little graphics of, I think, signature sort of Carl things that are associated with him. We also, again, the fan, Carl, 90s, you know, face covered, bang, bang, boom. So it's all there. And I also think the fact that it's not just like a fan pleat, oh, Carl. No, rather it's creating this fan sort of bodice shape is cool. It's different. It's not something that we see all the time. So like that, if you're going to reference Carl as a person and the persona, make it interesting, make it fun, make it avant-garde, make it humorous, make it witty. That's what this is. As for the rest of the look, love the skirt, fits beautifully, the big black gloves, gorgeous, like Jordan Roth, Daniel Roseberry, Scaparelli. Thank you. Appreciate you. You're a star. Next up is Kristen Stewart, and she is wearing Chanel. It's Cruise 2017. Listen, Kristen Stewart was one of Carl Lagerfeld's muses. She was a brand ambassador. I think she probably still is, but if she's not, she was for quite some time. Carl loved her. She was just somebody that he really was a fan of. He must have loved Twilight. I don't know. That Cruise 2017 collection was held in Cuba. They like rented out this big long sort of strip, I believe, in Havana, and they had like live music. I still can like hear the two women as they sing, and they're like, da da da. It was really good. I really enjoyed it. It's one of the, the soundtracks that stay constantly in my brain. From my understanding, I'm not the biggest Cuban history expert. Prior to Castro's taking over of Cuba, I'm not saying I'm pro, I'm not saying I'm against, I don't know enough about it. But prior to that, Cuba was kind of a hub for American interest. So you had, I believe, casinos and hotels and things like that. And Cuba was just kind of like a destination for Americans to go to. Very colonial mindset. So I feel like this sort of idea of the look, possibly what was being referenced here, this sort of glamour, early 20th century idea of Cuba as a international hub and playground for the rich and famous. That's my thoughts. I'm not saying that I enjoy that reference. Again, I'm just saying I'm pretty positive that is what was being channeled in that collection. What I will say is I do like the actual suit. I think it's beautiful. I love the cut of it. I like the try tie experience coming out. I love the tuxedo shirt with the little element of sheer. The pants are great. The little beautiful loafies, wonderful. Honestly, it's a great look. Do I wish that Kristen Stewart maybe it had like the hat and she took it off? That would have been fun, I personally think. But this is a real Chanel look and a half. It has reference, it has provenance. If we like, again, the provenance, that is up to you. Personally, not the biggest fan. That's, I'm pretty positive where it's coming from. And for Kristen, I think this is kind of her vibe. I think that Kristen, like Cara and like Giselle, is somebody that really did spend a lot of time with Carl, had a lot of relationships, and probably had a lot of memories with Carl. So pulling out a look like this, maybe this is a special sort of moment for Kristen that she really loved, that she really felt, you know, engaged with. And so I say, it's nice for them. Next up we have Lily Collins and she is wearing Vera Wang. This is a custom look. It's made up of a white bodice with little cap sleeves and then a black tulle skirt that flows with a little bit of white laid underneath it. It's not my favorite look. The other thing that's really of importance I guess technically about the look is the fact that at the back of the train of the dress it says Carl in big letters and I just feel like Vera Wang could have done better. It just feels a little bit blah, a little bit uninteresting. Yes, I'm sure that it's probably a reference or probably takes inspiration from a Chanel collection or an old couture style or something like that. Yada, yada, great, 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 wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Good for you. But at the same time, I think it's ugly. You know what I mean? I don't think that the skirt is really, really that great. I think the white underneath it really makes it seem a little bit drab, a little bit like, oh, you know, you got a couple whites in there. The other thing about it too is like the coral, the back, very uninspired, very ugly, very bad very uncreative. I just think that there are better ways to play on this. I think also like Vera Wang, wedding dress. Karl Lagerfeld, wedding dress. I think that there could have been some sort of melding and mashing together that would have made sense. And of course, Lily Collins is the conduit for which bright, sparkly Karl Lagerfeld name spelled out look appears. Emily in Paris, all encompassing. 
Next up, we have Maluma in Hugo Boss. Now, for some of you, you're going to say Hugo Boss. We have the new uniform for the Nazis. Karl Lagerfeld reference. Ding. I ain't going to tell you you're wrong. But as for the look, it's a sleeveless gray suit, wide leg pant, big, very pastor like from my understanding the stole does have embroidery that is tied to Karl Lagerfeld I can see if we zoom in really close there's the Karl Lagerfeld signature at the bottom I don't really care I just think it's shit and Hugo Boss doesn't really like have some big you know fashion direction that everybody knows about and everybody understands so like do something more interesting than a gray sleeveless suit please for all of our sake Next up, we have Maya Penn, and she is wearing Coach. Now, this is a beautiful dress, I will say. From my understanding, this is part of, like, the Coach Topia line, which is a new brand that they unveiled, and it's sustainable. And all of the fabric on this dress, from what we're seeing, actually comes from the most recent collection, and it's all, I believe, like, trims and scraps and things like that that were unused. Personally, I think this is a really, really great dress because, in my humble opinion, the beautiful flow, the beautiful swags of fabric, the drapery, in it to me is very sort of Chloe. I think the simplicity of it is really sort of 1960s, early 1970s Chloe. It's gorgeous. The way that the hems of each of those little sort of flounces is actually decorated with black lace and little crystals and perforations is gorgeous. It's beautiful. It's a really, really beautiful dress. It's really, really simple. And I think it's a great way of showcasing, oh, Carl Lagerfeld, not just Chanel reference. You can still do the black and white, easy peasy, lemon squeezy, but Carl's peasant blouses were very much so a commercial smash for Chloe. It was something that in reality, I can't believe nobody really touched upon really at all. And I think that it's being represented here in this gorgeous sort of Chloe look alike. Maya Penn looks beautiful in it. Well done to the coach team. Nobody else was really doing it like this and you've done it. Next up we have Michelle Yeoh and she is wearing Karl Lagerfeld. This is a custom look. Look at those sleeves. They feel very V&A. Now from my understanding, the sleeves in reality are probably inspired by Schiaparelli in the 1950s when she debuted those really, really big, beautiful sort of voluminous sleeves. I don't really get where the Karl reference comes in because from what I've seen, there haven't been too, too many of those big voluminous sleeve styles. There also happens to be some black in this dress that sort of runs out. There's a white dress underneath. There's big black boots buttoned down off the shoulder almost style I do think is kind of cute and listen like Michelle Yeoh she pull off anything without a doubt 100% but at the same time I just don't really see the Carl referencing and so that makes me upset it's sad because I feel like Michelle Yeoh really could have liked but she didn't she would look beautiful in like a Chloe 1970s look like sort of stunning she would look great in like a Trump Lane moment even like Chanel Bride I would take but this I don't see the vision. Next up, we have Naomi Campbell, and she is wearing a Chanel Haute Couture Spring 2010 look. It is a sorry kind of look-alike, sorry dupe in pink. It's a gorgeous silk. It's stunning. And then underneath it is a fully embroidered bustier bateau neckline style, which is something that Carl kind of did quite a bit. He would do these really, really beautiful draperies, and then there would be almost like this illusion of a top underneath. It's not really a top. It's in reality this gorgeous, gorgeous spiral embroidery. We can also see that the spiral embroidery kind of comes down along the drape in certain places and helps to sort of finish it off. Naomi looks beautiful. Naomi also, again, is a Carl kind of muse. She's somebody that walked for many of his iconic shows. It's really, really great to see her here. I think the dress fits her beautifully. It's a gorgeous style. The pink really pops. I like the idea of sort of bringing in that drapery, which Carl very much so was into. It's something that he did very, very well. Again, learned it from Patu and then continued it on throughout Chloe and Fendi and Chanel as well. Listen, I like it. I think it's cute. I think it's fun. It's not surface level Chanel referencing. I'm happy. Next up, we have Olivia Rodrigo, and she is wearing Tom Brown. This is probably the most intriguing Olivia Rodrigo has ever looked ever. Listen, it's a strapless dress that is sort of dotted up top in the bust area with all different fabric flowers. They all look chameleon like they're all black and white. Some of them are silky, some of them are satiny, some of them are textured. It's intriguing. It's fun. I think it pays homage, obviously, to the fabric flower element that Carl very much so was into doing. As for the actual dress, it's made up of black and white tassels and fringe that is floor length. Some of it is braided, which I think is really interesting. And I think low key kind of pays homage to the fact that, you know, a lot of tweed had little braided elements to it. It's smart, it's cool, it's fun. And at the same time, I think that the fringe element, as we talked about earlier, is still kind of important. Fringe on jackets and dresses and skirts and things like that. It's just that this feels a little bit more macrame-esque. It has a little 
little bit more of a 1970s sort of feeling to it in the way that it's kind of undone. The strings are very long. They're very sort of, again, flower childy, you know, normal, homely feeling. And I'm intrigued by it. As far as Livia Rodrigo goes, I'm going to give this like a B plus, A minus kind of vibe because normally she doesn't do fashion. Normally she doesn't really care. And normally I'm very angry. And right now I'm quite pleased. I think it looks fun. I think it's different for her. I think it still fits in with her aesthetic of like dresses that are kind of body conscious to a degree, but the texture is different. The inspiration is more fun. It's leaning into a little bit more fashion. So to Olivia Rodrigo, I say, good for you. You look happy and healthy. Next up, we have Olivia Wilde and she is wearing a custom Chloe creation. One of the more fun elements of this Olivia Rodrigo Met Gala look is the fact that she kind of matched with Margaret Zhang, who was the editor in chief of Vogue China. We love it. Cool. Listen, there is no need for who wore it better. What I also love about this dress is the gigantic sort of violin situation going on right up top. In the neckline, it flows down, it creates a stomach motif. So Olivia Wilde is wearing this Chloe Spring 1983 recreation. It is part of that Karl Lagerfeld trompe l'oeil effect. We can see this little baby violin. It starts up at the neck and it's little tuners, that's what I'm going to call them because I don't know the technical name for such things, are wrapping around this white little neck stem thing, again, don't know, comes down. We can see that the top of the violin body hits right around the bust area. Then the center, the waist of the violin alludes to the fact that there are some nice little cutouts. And then the bottom brings us to the skirt. It's a white, simple skirt, hits the floor, easy peasy. I love the little cape detail. I think it adds that Chloe 1970s sort of flow, that chicness, that easy breezy Parisian girl effect. It's really great. And also I love little matching cuffs. I think it's fun. The embroidery that's going on here in this gold is gorgeous. It's lovely. This is Carl at Chloe. Thank you very much, Olivia Wilde. I appreciate you a lot. Next up, we have Paris Hilton. This was her first Met Gala. She's wearing this off-the-shoulder black Marc Jacobs custom look. I read through what Paris said about the look. She said it's 97 or something. I was not sliving because we couldn't cite a source. We just said it was a little bit Marc Jacobs, Louis Vuitton, a little bit Karl Lagerfeld, but that was not the assignment. It's a black crystallized style. It sort of covers the bust area. It creates gloves. Don't really fit great. And then there's this black, I believe, faux leather element that creates a skirt. The chameleon, the black crystal choker, meh. Meh. Bottom of the barrel, boring, basic, uninteresting, uneducated, unwilling, unable, unready, unprepared, unmaking me feel anything but disgust. It's a camellia choker, great, okay? But like, did we need to go to the Mac Allen this? No. Carl and Mark knew each other. So like, where is the references? Where is the iconography? Where is the excitement? Where's the intrigue? It's not there. Also, I don't even think it fits that good. So there's that. Like, above the bus the crystal is so bad it's so bad it's so bad it's disgusting honestly i can't believe that they actually said oh let's do a fitting because i don't think they fit anything it doesn't fit that's not hot next up we have russell westbrook he is wearing Bodhi. listen Bodhi is all about upcycling fabrics i like this little cardigan style i think the multi pocket is great i think it's actually very clear and classic chanel collarless jacket sort of style it's a little bit more cardigan so it's a kind of like a hybrid cardigan kind of like a hybrid chanel jacket because it's the tweed but it doesn't have the collar it's more sort of cardigan-esque in the way that it's buttoned up with these little chinese buttons i love that element of it the pants they're baroque it's kind of black and white porcelain looking to me which Carl did reference over time. The black shoes. I do not love the black shoes. And for anybody that's ever going to be like, oh my god, wow, ballet flats. Like, you're just misogynist. You hate women because you don't want them to wear ballet flats. I don't want men to wear them either. Ugly. Doesn't matter who wears them. They're ugly. Besides the shoes, fine. But Russell Westbrook would not pass based on the shoe choice. Next up, we have Simu Liu, and he is wearing a Versace. Now, listen, some people are going to be like, this is so ugly. It's so gross. I'm not going to tell you how to feel about it. But one thing that I will say is this black suit might seem a little bit awkward, might seem a little bit strange. And it is, but it's also a reference. Spring 1991, Haute Couture by Chanel actually does have the silk sort of design that we're seeing here. There was a jacket that was done, and she is essentially, she's a cute little pink girl, but it has little like fabric flaps on it. So so it's almost three-dimensional. And I think that that's what Versace is doing here. And I just say to myself, like, Versace pulling out nuanced references in a way that none of the other girls could ever touch. I'm not saying you have to like it, although I will say that collar, accurate, tie, accurate, 
jacket, accurate. Gloves, not accurate. Could be better. The pants fit okay. The shoes are fine. The pants fit, they could fit better. But the jacket, that detail, that silky little detail is so intriguing to me. And I, I love the fact that they pulled out this really nuanced, weird, kind of kooky, crazy reference that nobody would have ever thought about. But Simu Liu is going for it. I'm intrigued. Next up is Sydney Sweeney wearing this custom Miu Miu dress. It's this beigey pink. It's kind of draped. It's full of crystals, little flowers, all that sort of stuff. Very Mutra Prada e in the sense of embroidery, embellishment. I do think that the shape of it, Chanel e Carl esque. I see it just in the way that the bow is placed and it creates a little mermaid silhouette and there's also like the embroidery, the embellishments, the applique of this sort of floral style, but it's like done in the more Miu Miu Nouveau, more technological, it's a little bit more mechanical. I get it. I just think as a look, it's kind of like, well, who cares? It's so interesting, not memorable, it's kind of sad. Next up we have Thames and Thames is wearing a custom Robert One creation. Now from my understanding, this Thames look is kind of influenced by spring 1992 haute couture in the way that these feathers are jutting out that collection had a lot of the feather sort of styles some were in headpiece form but others were jutting out of the hem of dresses so i'm intrigued by this style we can see up top there's a beautiful headpiece we never get a headpiece nobody ever wears a goddamn headpiece thames wearing a headpiece very grateful very happy. I love shape of it. I love the way that the little feathers fly and flutter out of it. And I love the fact that the feathers match what's going on in the actual garment. Now, as for the actual garment, it is a strapless black dress with a white skirt. As we can see, the boning is rigid. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's stunning. These feathers jut out of it. We can see that Robert One actually in his most recent old couture collection, his first runway, actually did these little feathers that would jut out of jackets. So not some like just not Robert One thing. No, 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 no. There is context in both houses. Love the gloves. The gloves are crazy. The gloves are wonderful. The gloves are intriguing and love the fact that the feathers jut out of them as well. As for the white skirt, the fact that it has this sort of overlay flap is really intriguing because there are images of Chanel runways where there were these sort of overlay flaps in different dresses and skirts. So I'm intrigued by it. The way that the white skirt flows out creates an intriguing train. I don't mind it. I'm fine with it. I think this is a great example of taking a Karl Lagerfeld reference, turning it into your own thing taking a reference that feels close to your house, close to what you do, close to your house codes, turning it into something that is all of your own. I'm pretty positive that the skirt with this overlay flap, it does have provenance in Chanel history, but at the same time, if you look at it from a certain direction, it kind of looks like the collar of a shirt, like Carl's collar of a shirt, which I kind of like. This is Thames and Robert One's first Met Gala. In reality, the look does a really great job of incorporating Robert One's own house codes and his design techniques that he's really been honing and building for himself but at the same time takes inspiration from Carl and it finds a way to not just be like a direct reference and at the same time it feels new it feels intriguing it feels different so I kind of love it shout out to Thames for going for it shout out for Robert One for designing it I'm into it. Next up, we have Tayana Taylor she is wearing custom Tom Brown it is a dress that is meant to look like a suit I like it I love it. Listen, it's a black and white tweed, really easy. I love the little cross stitch that goes along the shoulders. I love the high collar. I love the black tie. Pays homage to Carl's look, most definitely. The little veil with the sunglasses, also great. The thing that's really, really intriguing about the dress, though, is the hip cutouts. It's really wonderful. I think it's really different. I think it's very, very Tom. And the fact that it's like a faux double-breasted jacket, too, is really, really cool. The floor-length skirt with a little beautiful train is easy. And again, like, tweed isn't really something that you see trained. It doesn't sit, it doesn't stay, it doesn't shake your hand. It, it does what it wants, it falls the way it wants. Tom Brown said, no, 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 sweetie. You're gonna roll over, you're gonna play dead, and you're gonna get dragged along the floor. So, I'm into it. Tayana Taylor, constantly raising the bar. She is a fashion icon. I love her, I think she's amazing. I saw her in Dover Street Market recently, and I was like, huh? angels are singing. This one makes me happy. Next up we have Vanessa Kirby and she is wearing Chloe and this is a fall 1983 dress. I don't know if it's a recreation or if it's the actual dress. I presume that it's a recreation but in Carl's collection for fall 1983 at Chloe what we saw was these trompe l'oeils again and this shower head trompe l'oeil is amazing. It's a black dress in the front, really simple, really clean, really classic. It's halter style. But what happens is as the straps move on the back, you can see that the silver embroidery comes on. It creates a little shower head motif and these little strips of water in embroidery fall and flow and hit the floor of the dress, aka the hem area. And it creates this beautiful looking experience where it seems that Vanessa Kirby is most in fact taking a shower just on the red carpet, which I love that. I think that the Chloe team did a really, really good job of paying homage to the brand's history while 
also most definitely creating exciting, different, fun sort of vibes. I love it. It's perfect. It makes sense. I'm happy to see the recreation. And finally, we have Viola Davis. She is wearing a Valentino custom look. It has a big feather plumage in pink jutting out of the breast area. And then there are little feathers that are paper mache on, even though it's feather mache. They're gorgeous. They're beautiful. They flow out. The train of the dress is lovely. The fit of it is really, really nice. Do I think that it has anything to do with Karl Lagerfeld? Not really. Maybe we can pull out a Chanel reference that shows, you know, the feathers jutting out of things. And again, you know, I just talked about hems and the feathers, but there was a certain type of feather, like a certain silhouette of the feather, and that's why that reference was so clear and so easy. I'm not sure that this does that. Listen, I think it's a great Viola Davis look. I think it's fun. I think it's wonderful. I think it's chic. I think it's elegant. I think it fits really, really great. It's just not on theme, so that's that. Hi, Julius. Hope you're well. So that is the end of part two of our Met Gala Fashion Roast and Review for 2023. Let's talk about best and worst. Best, I'm going to have to put Vanessa Kirby, Olivia Wilde in there. I'm going to put Maya Penn in there. I'm going to put Tayana Taylor in there. Jordan Roth in the Scaparelli. Oh, Camilla Marone in the Rodarte was hot. I love that. And I think that's good. As for worst dressed, Lily Collins, Paris Hilton. Jackson Wang, Maluma, done. So that is the end of our part two of the Met Gala Fashion Roast Review. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next part. If you wanna watch the other parts, the link will be in the description box below. So with that, TTYL.